Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the monthly seminar of our network, the EUCD. Uh, today, we have the pleasure to have with us Deborah Menezes, uh, who kindly found the space on her agenda to give us the seminar. Uh, let me briefly introduce her. She has a very long CV, so I had to select a few points to, uh, to tell you here. Uh, Deborah got her degree in physics and her master from the Sao Paulo University. She got her uh, PhD from the University of Oxford in India. And she did a postdoc in Coimbra University in Portugal. Uh, and also she spent periods a senior uh, researcher in Sydney University in Australia and Alicante University in Spain. Currently, she's a full professor at Santa Catarina Federal University here in Brazil, and she's also a regular visitor professor at Coimbra in France. Mm -hmm. uh, she's, uh, she's currently in Brasilia because uh, she got a position as a direct, one of the directors of CNPQ, which is the Brazilian Funding Agency, as the director of Avaliações de Resultados e Soluções Digitais. She's also vice president of the Union de Físicos de Países de Língua Portuguesa. And she has been part in several board committees including the uh, National Institute of Science and Technology for Nuclear Physics and Applications, the board committee of UPAP, and also uh, in the area committee at CNPQ. She was the Dean of Research and Outreach in Santa Catarina Federal University. She has been coordinator of the grad program in physics of the same university. And she was the first woman women to be elected president of the Brazilian Fiscal Society. And recently she was recognized with the CONFAP prize. So uh, this was only a selection of her, uh, of her CV. And she dedicates herself to study nuclear physics, focusing on equation, focusing on equation of state, neutron star, relativistic models and nuclear astrophysics. And more recently, she's also dedicating time to science communication. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Ah, and more important than everything, she's a member in our network. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you here today, Deborah. Please go ahead. I'm not a very active member. So thank you very much for the introduction. I see that the people who are against uh, that we speak Portuguese and Spanish are not present. So maybe I could start speaking Portuguese. What do you think? Well, well, yeah. well. Well, great. Does okay. anybody? If you speak slowly, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe. But if you can speak English. I'll yeah, speak maybe, English. Better, I'm, please. I'm just kidding. Yeah, you see, there's always someone who's against the Portuñol, but uh, eventually uh, we will... We'll... No, I think if you, if you speak Spanish, it's okay. <laughs> okay, no, I'll speak English. <laughs> I speak Spanish very well. <laughs> okay, so um, thanks very much for the invitation, Anna. It's always a pleasure to listen to this topic. And I will start my seminar showing... Um, this uh, figure of this EPJA uh, special issue. This is a topical collection um, edited by Pedro Costa, myself, Vladimir Skokov, and Karsten Urban. And of course, I'm not going to talk about uh, everything that is in this uh, special issue, but you are all welcome to take a look and see if you find something that interests you. It's, uh, I think it's a nice topic. Okay, so I will talk about the QCD phase diagram in strong magnetic fields. And of course, not about everything, but just about how to build the QCD, look at uh, critical endpoints and magnetars and well, a little bit of, a little bit of not everything, a little bit of some things. So let's see if it works. Okay, so this is a, a figure that I've taken from Crew Toshim seminar here 
uh, as part of this network. And I like it very much because it shows some uh, figures that uh, interest me, like the magnetars. And then you see that the magnetic field is of the order of 10 to the 15 Gauss. And also some uh, physical, medical uh, imaging and other equipment. And then you see that this modern MRR system has a, mag a magnetic field of the order of 10 to the 50th Gauss. And um, also the human brain um, that has a magnet very small magnetic field as compared with the magnetic field of the early universe, which is 10 to the minus 11 Gauss. So I, I liked this figure because it, it reminded me of my first job when I was, uh, when I finished it, my undergraduate studies, I was hired uh, at, the, at a hospital and I was involved with this magnetocardiography, which is a technique that measures magnetic fields produced by electrical current in the heart. So this is different as the electrocardiogram um, cardi that uh, when you can see the electric signal, you see the magnetic signal and they are identical just the phase is slightly different as you can imagine. But this was very interesting because uh, it made me interested in magnetic fields and the very broad applications um, that are possible because of the variation of the magnetic fields with uh, time. Unfortunately, this uh, equipment is no longer used. There were just three in the world. And they were um, discontinued, but they were very useful, for instance, to uh, get the a baby's heart signal when the baby was inside the mother's belly, which was not possible with uh, other equipments at that time. This was 1985. And now, of course, there are other equipments that do the same thing. OK, so let's go to the topic, uh, to the specific topic. and. So why are we going to consider magnetic fields apart from the interesting magnetocardiography uh, exam? It's because they are everywhere, as uh, I've shown in Tushin's figure. And this is, a, I'm just uh, showing this picture to let you know that uh, the results I'm going to show sometimes comes in uh, uh, as a GEV, as EB, where E is the electric charge, sometimes just B in Gauss or Tesla. And the way we convert things depends a lot on the units we use. So whether we use have side Lorentz, Gaussian, natural units, we have to use different conversions. And I will try to remember and show the correct conversion um, all the time, so whenever I'm going to show a new application. So this is the well-known QCD phase diagram. And the question is, what would happen if matter was subject to strong magnetic fields? So I'm, show you, I'm going to show you uh, two results of a, a paper that is already more than 10 years old. But it was on one of the first papers uh, in which I was involved is studying magnetic field effects. And I don't know why, if it's appearing for you as it is for me, but this is not an infinitive, this is a mu for chemical potential. So if we look at the critical chemical potential as a function of the magnetic field, we can see that it's more or less steady it, and it does not depend on the temperature, but then it drops and then it increases again. So the values are different for different temperatures, but the behavior as a, as a as an effect of the magnetic field, is always more or less the same, stable, down, and then up. Um, so this was obtained with the NJL model, the Nalazino model, with UDNS quarks. And for what we call symmetric, I don't know if it's really symmetric, but symmetric matter in the, in the um, because I've used identical chemical potentials for the three quarks. And then if you look at the QCD phase diagram, you see that uh, the red line stands for 10 to the 17 Gauss, which exactly coincides with what we would obtain with non-magnetized matter. And when we increase the magnetic field, there is a deviation for lower 
chemical potentials and lower and, and higher temperatures. And then it deviates for higher temperatures and higher chemical potential. So this is a very interesting behavior. And it led us think that we, it would be very nice if we could really understand magnetic field effects at high densities and low temperatures, as in neutron stars, at low densities and high temperatures, as in heavy ion collisions, at low densities and low, low temperatures, as in the crust of neutron stars. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this pasta phase. And if the critical endpoint is really there, how its location would change with the magnetic field. So I will start with the last topic and analyze the critical endpoint again with the Nambucho Nalazinho and the Nambucho Nalazinho plus the Polyakov loop. So I've chosen one specific parameter set and I first analyze it for non magnetized matter and then for strong magnetic fields. And different scenarios were studied. So the first one was exactly the same one that I talked before. So exactly the same chemical potentials for UDNS quarks. And then I've analyzed the same chemical potentials for UND, which would be really what we normally call symmetric matter and no strangeness. And then identical densities for UDNS quarks. And of course, identical densities uh, for particles with different masses mean different chemical potentials. And then matter and beta equilibrium as in the equation of states of neutron stars. And the results we got are shown in this figure, non-magnetized matter. And then you see clearly that each scenario gives a different results for the critical endpoint. And when the Polyakov loop is added to the NJL model, uh, the critical endpoint shifts towards higher temperature and uh, lower chemical potentials, the, the results in, in red. Uh, and then if we look at this um, situation where we have U and D with equal chemical potentials and no strangeness, no S quarks, then we see that the full line I've shown you in the uh, figure on the bottom, this blue line, um, is the result that we obtained for zero ISO speed. And then whenever we change the amount of uh, D quarks with respect to the U quarks, then we would also obtain very difficult critical endpoints. So, and if we consider just uh, U, D, and S quarks with equal chemical potentials, as I've uh, just told you about, then there is also a small shift from the situation with just U and D quarks. So if you look at the red dot as compared with the blue diamond, you see that there is also a little bit difference. So the conclusion is that whichever uh, we want to examine, um, depending on the situation, we are going to have a different position for this critical endpoint. What happens then if we add magnetic fields? So the full lines represent non-magnetized matters, non-magnetized matter, and uh, when we increase the magnetic fields, you see that there is this uh, kind of backbending. So the results, they move towards first uh, low chemical potentials and low temperatures, but then the temperature also increases and the chemical potential increases as well. And there is also something even more peculiar. If you look at very low um, temperatures, then we can we find we found two critical endpoints. So whichever the critical endpoint is, if it really exists, then we can see that it uh, it depends on the scenario we are going to consider. Okay, so now let's move to magnetars. You all know that this nicer, which is the acronym for Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer, was not launched into. 2017 and since 2021 it has been sending us information about neutron stars and there will be another telescope expected to be launching launched in 2030 and probably more information will come so this is a, an area that will be uh, i think uh, visited many times in the next years due to this information that will probably 
be sent to us. Uh, and what are they exploring? They are exploring neutron stars, and uh, we don't know if the neutron, uh, if these neutron stars can be either in binary systems or isolated sometimes. And the main neutron star manifestations are pulsars and accreting X ray binaries. Those two uh, manifestations account for almost everything that uh, has been detected so far. But magnetars do not fit into these categories. They are normally isolated, so they are not part of binary systems. And its main, their main power source is believed to be the magnetic field. And there are two classes of magnetars, uh, soft gamma ray repeaters and anomalous X-ray pulsars. So there is this famous McGill magnetar catalog. And if you, if you take a look, then they, whenever a new candidate is uh, found, it appears in the catalog. And so far, only 30 magnetars are believed to be detected. It does not mean that there are just a few. So we expect to have more results about uh, this special classes of neutron stars in the future. And how do we know uh, their magnetic fields? So they are, they, they, the value of these magnetic fields uh, depend on some hypotheses. The first one is that if we consider, for instance, uh, a rotation powered neutron star, the spin down is uh, related to the decrease in rotational energy. If one assumes that this decreasing is due only to magnetic dipole radiation, then the magnetic field is proportional to the square root of PP dot, where P is the period and P dot is uh, how it uh, changes with time. So typical values for the period are two to 12 seconds and to the P dot 10 to the minus 13 to 10 to the minus 10. And if you look at what has been seen so far, uh, the consequence is that magnetars, uh, are believing that those hypotheses are correct, uh, have magnetic fields of the order of 10 to the 4, 14 to 10 to the 15 at the surface. And millisecond pulsars, for instance, uh, have magnetic fields of the order of 10 to the 8, to 10 to the 9 Gauss, and so on. So most pulsars. Uh, have a surface magnetic field of the order of 10 to the 12 Gauss and most magnetars at the order of 10 to the 15 Gauss. But when we are going to study equation of states, they are only sensitive to magnetic fields larger than 10 to the 17 Gauss. So how do we deal with this smaller magnetic fields? What is, your, to what is your imagination? The figure. <laughs> <laughs> the figure is just my imagination. Of course, there are no figures for magnetars, so not a few. That's, uh, not a I just wanted a picture. Yeah. Okay, so let's see how to deal with this value um, in some of the things that we can actually calculate. So to talk about it, I will first show briefly the structure of neutron star, and. We believe that it's, uh, the neutron star is composed mainly of four, part, four parts. An outer crust, an inner crust, that's the part that I've called pasta phase, probably described by the pasta phase, and then the core. It can have an outer core and an inner core. And I'm going to start studying the transition density between the core and the crust, the outer core and the inner crust. How can we do that? Well, we then rely on what we know about thermodynamics of, two, of systems with uh, different components. And one of the possibility is the, to study spinal instabilities, which are obtained for liquid gas phase transitions. So, or systems that behave or that have phase transitions as the liquid gas uh, system does. So there are two kinds of spinal instabilities, and they define what we call metastable region. There is a thermodynamical spinal and a dynamical spinal. I'm not going to 
there is too much detail, but, but the idea how to calculate them um, is uh, for the first one is just to write uh, a, uh, a, a symmetric matrix of the free energy derivatives with respect to the densities of the constituents of the system. So, for instance, let's suppose that we have a system with protons and neutrons, then we have to calculate the second derivative of the free energy with respect to the density of protons and density of neutrons at a fixed temperature. Then there is the dynamical spinodal that is obtained directly from the Vlasov equation that I've written here. And in this case, F is the distribution function of particles and antiparticles, and H is the Hamiltonian that describes the system. Okay. The other possibility is to calculate binodals. So binodals are regions that define uh, uh, coexistent, the binodals define regions uh, where matter, both, both systems can coexist, so liquid and gas, for instance. And um, this is a very interesting paper by Miller and Siro, and it tells us explicitly how to calculate uh, these phase transitions in multi-component systems. But I'm just, just going to show you the results. So this is a typical binodal sections. And you see, well, I, I've used them for different quantum uh, hydrodynamic models and for different temperatures. But what you can see if you look at these pictures, that if you look at one certain pressure, let's say 0.3 in both graphs, then you can see that there are two different proton fractions for the same pressure. So if you look at the one on the left, let's say 0.3, for instance, then there is this zero proton fraction. So it's a, a system with neutrons only. And then if you run with your eyes, you see that you have this uh, 0.2 something 0.18, a proton fraction of 0.18. If you look at down, you have the same thing. Whenever, if you look at 0.3, the pressure 0.3 maybe per femme cubic, and you see you have two different points for two different proton fractions. And one has a lower proton fraction and the other one has a, a larger proton fraction, which we um, co which would correspond to a system like liquid and gas, not really liquid and gas, but uh, low density and a little bit higher density. This binodal section decreases as the temperature increases, as uh, in, a, in a figure similar to what some people call filet mignon, goes like this. Okay, so how to calculate the cross core transition density from spinodal, spinodal uh, regions and binodal regions? So I'll show you an example, also for non magnetized matter. So here I have a dynamical and a thermodynamical spinodal, which are plotted in terms of density of proton and density of neutrons. And then I plot the equation of state. That's the dotted line. You can see very low. The equation of state is written in, the, in beta equilibrium. And then you see two dots, uh, a red dot and a blue dot. That's where this equation of state cross crosses the, the two spinodal regions. So those two points define the density where I have this transition from one system to the other. In our case, the core to the cross transition density. So based on these uh, calculations, you can see, if you look uh, on the right-hand side, for meta and beta equilibrium, let's uh, look at, I have used two different parameters sets. Let's look at uh, DDME2, for instance. Then the red triangle is the, the region where the crossing takes place if I consider binodals. And then if I consider dynamic spinodal, then there is this blue triangle. And if I consider thermodynamic spinodal, there is this square, uh, pink square. And the other one is Thomas semi calculation. I'm not going to mention it here. But anyway, this is quite unknown. You see, it can vary if, if I, it can vary from 0 0.07 something up to almost 0 0.09. So we know it's low density, but exactly the point, the point depends uh, depends on the model we are using and on the 
formalism we decide to use to define this cross score. Okay, but let's choose one of them and see the effects of the magnetic fields. So we've chosen thermodynamic just and question. so can, yes. can you consider both or you have to choose a formalism or it's no, a, so you see, picture. It's a no. The ideal picture would be that everything would give the same result. Okay. Okay. But this is not the case. So depending on the formalism I choose, I have a slightly different result and it's also model dependent. So if I want to include magnetic field to see how it varies, I have to choose one because it's already very uncertain. So I've decided to calculate the spinodal stability and see uh, the crossing with the equation of state uh, using magnetic fields to see the effect as compared with non-magnetized matter. Is it clear? Okay. Yes. Okay, so this is the calculation of a spinodal, in this case, thermodynamic spinodal. And for non-magnetized matter, that's the line in red, and for different values of the magnetic field. So I've used in this uh, B star, that was, uh, I think, uh, Latimer's definition, and my collaborators liked it, but it's very easy to translate. So the first picture on top, I have zero magnetic field and 10 to the 15th, because B is 10 to the second uh, times this uh, E. So 10 to the 15 does, as I told you before, it's not possible to distinguish both equation of state, so the results coincide. And then I increase a little bit uh, um, the uh, value of the magnetic field, so 10 to the 16th. The curves are still, are still pretty much the same, but you start seeing these small variations, these small kicks that are related to the feeling of the Landau levels. That if you look at 10 to the 17, that's the picture uh, on the left bottom, then you already see these larger variations. And if you increase even further the magnetic field to 10 to the 18, then you see these very big variations due to the Landau model. Now I want to see the crossing with the equation of states and variable. So uh, if you look at the upper panels, I have thermodynamic spinodos. If you look at the bottom panels, I have this uh, dynamical spinodos. So the values are, as I told you before, not identical. But what makes everything interesting is that when I consider non-magnetized matter, I have just one point. And when I consider magnetized matter, as we have this uh, feeling of the Landau levels and these variations in the spinodal curves, then my equation of state can cross these curves more than once. So we have this, uh, we have zoomed uh, the results. So you can see clearly that sometimes we have this double crossing. And then how do we know? How can we compute the, the cross thickness? Can we, how can we see the transition density? So I've used the recipe by Hansel and where he explains that once we, we know uh, the core, we can integrate from the core until this uh, transition density, cross core uh, phase transition, with the usual TOV. And then we obtain the mass and the radius for the core. And for, for the, the crust, then he has this recipe for the mass of the crust and the radius for the total neutron star. That depends basically on what we already know, mass and radius of the core, and on the pressure and the chemical potential at the, uh, the, the transition density, the cross core transition density. So this is not complicated to compute. And once we have that, we know the thickness of the crust, which is the radius of the neutron star minus the radius of the, the core, and then we have the thickness of the crust. Okay, but now we have an uncertainty on the uh, density of the transition from the core to the crust. So I've analyzed two situations. In the first one, uh, this is a canonical star, so a star with 1.4 solar mass. 
and I've used a skirm, a skirm type uh, non-relativistic model. Could have used any other one. And then I've considered the equation of state is isotropic. So I'll come back to this uh, anisotropy or anisotropic system later on. If we do that, you can follow the table and you can see that uh, as the magnetic field e increases, then there is uh, this L1, R1 for the core and L1 for the crust. And then second part of the table, there is this uh, R2 for the core and L2 for the crust. And they are slightly different because they are related to the when they have the equation of state and it across two points for one of the points and for the other uh, point as well. So if we do that and we calculate what's the difference between these two points of the crust, you see that it's uh, uh, always, I would say, more or less small, but it increases with them with the magnetic field and then it decreases a little bit. Um, if we compute the crust size, take into account into this uncertainty, we have something of the order of one kilometer. If you look at L L1 crust and L2 crust, it's always 0.9 something or 0.899, so around 0.9, so less than one kilometer and in, those, in both cases. Although um, there are some simulations that say that the expected crust size is of the order of 2.4, but this is an old paper from 2014. And so maybe uh, I'll show you the Lorraine results. Maybe there is uh, a bit differences based on more modern calculations today. But anyway, the expected crust size in one, a neutron star of about 12 kilometers is of the order of two kilometers. Okay, then we've repeated the calculation using Lorraine. So Lorraine is a code that's freely available. You, anyone can get it and use it. And it solves Einstein, Maxwell, and equilibrium solutions all self-consistently. And uh, they, they, then you decide which is the magnetic field that you, you want to consider. We've repeated the same calculation, and then our results were quite different. Again, we have two points because we have this uncertainty on the crossing. It crosses twice. And then L1 crust is about uh, 3, and L2 also about 3. Again, we have more or less the same behavior, so it increases a little bit. The, that delta L crust increases a little bit, and then decreases if you look at the last uh, column of the table. And if you look at the the size of the a little bit larger than what was expected. But, well, this may be an effect of the magnetic field. Okay. So what's the effect of the magnetic field on the neutral cycle systems? This is uh, very much, pretty much known. So I'm just going to show a picture so you can see. The top figures were obtained with uh, GEM1, one of the parameterizations of quantum hydrodynamics. And the second one with the same parameterization plus the inclusion of strange mesons uh, as uh, interaction, um, well, play an interaction role among the, the hadrons. You can clearly see that there are this discontinuity and there's little bit kinks when we move from non-magnetized matter on the left to uh, magnetized matter. I think here magnetic field is, uh, it's written, three times 10 to the 18 gauss. So this is an effect of the magnetic field. So the curves that were a little, they were very smooth are no longer smooth. They have these kinks. And depending on the value of the magnetic field, there are also some shifts, small shifts on the appearance, on the onset of the different particles. This is again the same kind of study, but now we have included delta variants. So delta variants are, they obey Harita Schwinger equations. They have spin three halves. So we've included them and the Coupling constants with the mesons 
those are highly unknown. So we played a bit with these coupling constants. And you see, if you look at the top figures, you see non-magnetized matters. For the, the, first, the first two figures were obtained for L3 omega rho, which is a parameterization for quantum hydrodynamics. And the last one is for CMF. That's uh, a model developed by Stefan Schramms and Veronica Dexheimer. So we calculated to see how model dependent our results were. And they are quite model dependent. So you can see if you look at first figures that you have these deltas appearing uh, around, let's say, 0 0.7 times to the minus 3. But if you look at, at the CMF, um, you have uh, some delta 0 is not there. So this is quite model dependent. And uh, the other thing I was going to say is that uh, the appearance of these delta particles uh, also depend on the coupling constants. And you see that they vary quite a bit uh, from non-magnetized matter to magnetized matter. So if you just look at the first two graphs, top and bottom, you see that uh, only delta minus and delta zero appear. But if you look at magnetized matter, you can also have delta plus and delta plus plus. So um, it seems that uh, the magnetic fields um, somehow helps the appearance of uh, other particles. Okay. So which are the results that we obtained with Lorin for the mass radius? Um, so they've been shown in these figures. And once again, you see, if you compare the solid lines for non-magnetized matter with the dashed lines for a magnetic field of the order of 10 to the 17 Gauss, and then dotted line for 10 to the 18 Gauss, the results vary a lot. They are very different uh, and not as simple as done by some people that just use the, the TOB, myself included. I've done that in the past before I could use Lorraine. So the maximum masses are not very much affected by the magnetic field, but the behavior of the curve and the, the radius of the canonical star, for instance, are very much different. And we even have this strange behavior uh, for equation of states that includes very high magnetic fields. Okay. Okay, so now I want, I'd like to talk about uh, effects of anisotro anisotropy in, in magnetars. So before doing that, I would like to discuss anisotropic effects on a free gas to understand what, what it, uh, why it's important and why it uh, has to be included and what has been done in the literature. So um, again, we have to be careful about the units that are going to be used. And then I'm going to just mention two half side Lorentz units. Normally, the magnetic field itself contributes to a, a quantity that's B squared over two to the pressure and the, the energy density. But if we use Gaussian units, it's B squared over eight pi. So this is uh, common in the literature. And this difference is just due to a different choice of units. Okay, so normally what we do is to calculate the energy density as the expected value of T00, for the zero, 00 component of the energy moment tensor. And then we can compute P par parallel and P perpendicular. One as a function of the expected value of Tzz or 33 if you prefer, and P perpendicular as the sum of Txx and Tyy. And then you can also look at the differences between P, the perpendicular pressure and the parallel pressure. And this difference is related to the magnetization times the magnetic field. Um, and then we have different expressions for the densities and for the energies if we have charged particles or uncharged particles. I didn't write all the equations here, but the equation number six is particularly important. That's the Landau levels. So the feeling of the Landau levels depends on the spin and on the, it's going to uh, depend on the charge of the particles. And this is expression is valid only for spin one half particles. So if we want to include uh, the spin three half particles as the deltas, for instance, the expression is a little bit different. Okay, 
So let's take a look at proton first. So let's assume we have a proton gas and look at the, the well, here it's written transverse and longitudinal or perpendicular and parallel, it's the same pressures. And then you see that, uh, of course, then they are not the same. Okay, so the effect of the magnetization times the magnetic field is really something measurable. You can take a look and you see they are not identical. And then if we look for uh, the relation between these two pressures for appears if we have anomalous magnetic moments included. And for protons, they are always different due to the charge uh, with or without anomalous magnetic moments. And these calculations were done for five times 10 to the 18 gauss. And then we've investigated, ah, and this was done for zero temperature. Then we've investigated what would happen for systems at higher temperatures. And again, you can see that, uh, well, we've used a different way of looking at these differences, but the important thing is to see that if you have low temperatures up to 30 MeV, the effects are present. And uh, they are just not present if you have really very low, very high temperatures as 500 MeV, then everything coincides. Okay? Otherwise, this effect is present. So how to deal with these anisotropic effects on magnetars? So if we look at the literature, we find three different uh, ways of doing that. The first one is just to ignore it. Anisotropy effects are ignored, and one, has, uh, one can just write an isotropic equation of state, just one expression for depression, one expression for the energy density, and then you run TOV. So this is one possibility. Um, the second possibility is to assume chaotic magnetic fields. Chaotic magnetic field uh, was proposed by Zeldovich. And um, in this calculation, he assumes that the O3 rotation symmetry remains valid. And then although there is an isotropic, uh, although there is a, a uh, a, a, a magnetic field present in the system, there is just one pressure. And then we can run TOV and problem solved. There is an also way of doing that. And the third one is to really take an isotropy into account. And then one has one pressure for uh, one expression for the parallel pressure and another expression for the perpendicular pressure. And we can compute magnetization. And then I'll tell you what to do to obtain mass and radius results. So, so let's first examine the effects of this uh, calculation of magnetization. So you, if you look at 10 to the 17 Gauss, you see it's uh, we have this small um, fluctuations around zero. Then it increases with the magnetic field. So 10 to the eight, 18 as a little bit more, three times 10 to 18, it fluctuates more. And 10 to the 19, it's quite big, the magnetic field effects. So if you look down at the figure I called number six, you will see this is a, ah, this was calculated with the MIT bag model. So the simplest one I could get. And for three times 10 to the 18 Gauss, you can see that the perpendicular pressure is uh, coincides with the case when I have just this isotropic system, but the parallel pressure can go to zero. Um, and in these calculations, that term proportional to b squared was taken into account. So if you look at the lit literature, you see that many people just ignored this parallel uh, pressure. Although sometimes they calculate it, they just use the perpendicular pressure to run the TOV and obtain the results. Uh, now, if you look at the right for the figure number four, you see that 10 to the 19 Gauss, the effects are at peak, even without the term proportional to B squared. Okay, then you, can, okay, you already see the shift between these two pressures. And if you look down in figure eight, 
Then I've used a uh, chaotic magnetic field. And then you see that you just really see uh, a larger difference for very high magnetic fields of the order of 10 to the 19. Otherwise, they're almost coincident. They're very close. OK, so in the cases that I have perpendicular and uh, parallel pressure, and I have to run TOV, or people run, uh, used to run TOV, we need this V squared term. And when we do that, if we don't make it uh, depending on the density on, uh, or on the energy density, we only have real results different from non-magnetized matter for 10 to the 17 Gauss, as I have already told you. But then at the surface of the magnetars, the magnetic field is 10 to the 15. So how can we deal with that? So Chakrabarty had an idea to um, write an expression for B as a function of the baryonic density. I've written here as a, thing, as a function of the energy density that I prefer, but the idea is the same. So you can fix the surface magnetic field, that's B surface, 10 to the 15 Gauss, and then you can, it, it increases towards the center of the star up to 10 to the 18 or maximum 10 to the 19 Gauss. Okay, so people, have done this for a long time and then have concluded that the maximum mass would uh, increase. But then there is a problem, right, that uh, maybe should be taken into account. If B depends on the density, it means that it's divergent, it's not zero. So one of the macro equations is violated. So this has to be taken into account. So nowadays we have Lori and it's available, so there is no reason to keep uh, avoiding or circumventing this problem of this uh, anisotropic effect and keep using TOV. So it's not no longer necessary because Lorene tells us what to do correctly and solves the problem. So if Lorene is used, the magnetic field is uh, decomposed as a sum of uh, uh, multiples. And then if we look at these figures for two different models, uh, you will see that solid lines it, it, uh, refer to this monopolar uh, component, dashed for dipoles, dashed dotted for quadrupoles, and so on. And then you see that uh, this is um, model dependent, but not that model dependent. You see the values are more or less the same, the behavior is the same, the, and the, the radius of the star where the dipole moment is larger, is more, is the same. So we have a, a very, uh, I don't know, steady result with Lorraine. So, and this was obtained for a 1.8 solar mass star. So last point of my talk, I've talked already, a lot already, is go to go back to the QCD phase diagram and to show briefly how to obtain this uh, diagram if we want to consider two models. And again, there are different prescriptions in the literature and they provide slightly different results. So this is unknown. So we are playing with models and then we are obtaining a slightly different, although the behavior is more or less the same, the exact point is the quantitative results are not, not the same. So in this figure, you see in purple what you will be taking if we use maxwell prescription. So maxwell prescription is the one used when people uh, obtain the equation of states for hybrid stars. So chemical potentials for hadronic matter, and um, sorry, beta equilibrium enforced for hadronic matter and beta equilibrium enforced for quark matter. And then you see when the pressure the chemical potential when the two curves cross and then you define the point where you move from one uh, equation of state to the other one. And then there is uh, this red one which is obtained with flavor conservation. This was uh, a prescription proposed by Bombach and he claims that if you have a conversion from a hadronic star to a quark star, this is so fast that during the, the transition uh, density, you have no time to enforce beta equilibrium. So beta equilibrium is enforced in the hadronic phase, but it's not enforced in the quark phase, but uh, flavor conservation 
has to be observed. And then the one in red is when you have to flavor symmetric matter, just neutrons and protons and uh, UND quarks. I've used for the hadronic matter one of the parameterizations of the quantum hydrodynamics or Valeska model. And for the quark matter, MIT bag model is a vector interaction and the bag constant depending on the temperature. Okay. This is non magnetized matter. Sorry. So this, this is the, the baryon chemical potential or is quark? Yes, potential? yes, baryon chemical potential. Bion. Yes. Okay, so well, I, I will skip this one. Okay, so how to uh, obtain the crossing point? So th those are two models, another two models that I just picked. So for Sorry? No, we're already in Sorry, sorry, it was my fault. Ah, okay. So for, I've used GM1. For the quark phase. And the important thing is to see of the, red, the black curve with the curves obtained from quark model. And if you look at uh, at, your, at the right figure, you don't see the crossing. Not, not always you have this uh, the possibility of these phase transitions. When and when you have, then you can start building your phase diagram. Okay, this is zero temperature, and this is also zero temperature. But this is obtained with now magnetized matter. So we have considered magnetized matter, zero temperature, and flavor conservation. So just one of the prescriptions I've shown before. And you don't have to worry about all those models, but the idea is to show this brown line that stands for the hadronic matter and all the dashed lines that refer to different quark models. And you see that depending on the model, the crossing of the, the two curves uh, takes place in different uh, temperature and chemical potentials. So it means that we are going when we build, when we run for the different temperatures, we are going to build a different uh, QCD phase diagram curve. Okay, this is a correct show. So just to finish, uh, there is a recipe for the latent heat, which is based on the pressure of the hadronic phase. This is something that has no dimension and then the energy densities of both phases. And I'm sorry, I should have uh, taken the reference when, I, when I've seen this, but the authors of this reference claim that if we could obtain uh, a latent heat going from a positive value to a negative value, when it crossed the zero at that point, I would be reaching the critical endpoint. So we decided to calculate with these two models, and we've never found it. You see that as the magnetic field increases, you have this uh, steady configuration, so it's uh, more or less constant. But then I decided to look at the real definition of the latent heat, which is just the difference between uh, entropy times temperature. And then in this case, this is non-magnetized matter again, but it, in this case, we really have uh, this uh, effect that makes the latent heat goes up and then down, and then it reaches zero. And if, if this is indeed uh, an indication of the critical endpoint, if we are building the QCD phase diagram, we know that beyond this temperature, the calculation no longer makes sense because these calculations are all based on Gibbs conditions and hence, they are all first order phase transitions. And we know that after the critical endpoint, we should have a crossover. So this is something that has to be still calculated for with magnetic fields. So you can all do that with your preferred uh, equation of state. And I will try to do that as soon as I have some time and see what happens. Well, that's it. I've talked a lot. Those are my uh, collaborators, Constanza, Francesca, and then people in Brazil, and sometimes also uh, Norberto, who is here. And that's it. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Deborah, for the very nice overview uh, about several topics. So let's now open for questions. Christian? Thank you, Deborah. Very nice talk. Um, um, you, you are using uh, an Ambu General Assini uh, in, in, in the most of a uh, um, question of state. Ambu not Ambu most. So, no? not here. Here, here, just in the beginning. Just in the beginning? Ah, yeah, so, but, in the beginning. Because, uh, so, uh, because this, uh, in, the, in the last slides, uh, uh, no. this parameter G, GB is, uh, is the yeah, this is uh, isn't the, the here. of the, uh, yeah, here. Yeah, no, this is a, an MIT model with a vector interaction. So this GV is the coupling of the vector interaction and also this V0 to the force, uh, that I call Dirac Lagrangian density enforced. Let's see. Yeah, I don't have um, the Lagrangian density. Okay, but this is an MIT bag model with a vector interaction plus this uh, Dirac interaction. Yeah, well, well the, my question was related because uh, even in Nambu John Lassine, you have this vector uh, interaction, but uh, you, can, you cannot uh, fix it, the, the coupling. So in mm -hmm. this case, uh, yeah, yeah, um, you just try with different values. Uh, is there any, any, any way to, to? Well, there are some limitations that come from, I, I, I don't remember now, I think it's perturbative QCD. So we've just uh, used uh, a selected value. So we, ju we didn't run it freely. Uh, this is an repulsion interaction. So we've... Uh, We've checked how to, let's see if I have it somewhere. No, I don't. Um, ah, maybe here, here, you see? Oh, yeah. we, we've used it up to 0. 0.3 families to, to squared. So we didn't, it was not completely free. It, it was limited within a certain range. And the idea was to limit it due to this uh, calculation that was done that said that it should be limited. But we, we have also used this model to compute uh, uh, quark equation of states. And then we, to, that could satisfy uh, two solar masses, two something solar masses, and to have the radius restricted to a certain value. So we already had uh, some restrictions for these values and we, we just decided to stick to those values. Oh, okay, I see. I see. Can I ask you an, an, another question? Uh, can you show me again the, the this uh, diagram with QCD faces these two models? This one? Oh, this one, okay. So, uh, these two flavor symmetric matter is the, the, the usual uh, up down with the. Uh, uh, with beta equilibrium. Um, no, no beta equilibrium. Ah, no to beta flavor equilibrium. is no beta equilibrium. To flavor is just symmetric matter. For the hadronic part, equal chemical potentials for protons and neutrons, and for and for quark matter, equal chemical potentials for U and D quarks. So no strangeness involved. Okay. Ah, okay. So so the, the other ones uh, are in, in beta equilibrium. Yeah, the other ones. Uh, maximum prescription both phases in beta equilibrium and flavor conservation the same amount of uh, UD and S box in both sides of the diagram. Okay, oh, so in principle they are reachable uh, even in the outer core. In this case, for example, the Maxwell, the one with Maxwell. Uh, Description. And hear you. This is, this is near the, the nuclear mass. Yeah, I think you should ask again, Christian, because she said she could hear you. Okay, so uh, in in, in uh, with the Maxwell prescription, so the the the, the 
the, this phase transition, this transition can occur for lower chemical potential. It could be even in the outer core. Um, no, no. Maybe the reflex. When we are we are, when we are using maxo prescription, yeah, indeed we are. This is the prescription used to build hybrid stars. So if we want quarks to be present, the mm -hmm. central energy density should be higher than the density where the phase transition takes place. Okay. But when you are looking at this uh, flavor conservation, it's not used to, to build a hybrid star. It's just to use to calculate nucleation, for instance. It's just uh, the idea that uh, when you were, you were trans transforming a hadronic star into a quark star. And when you do that, it's so quickly that you do not have time at the transition to have uh, beta equilibrium enforced. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, what was the last? I'll repeat. It. I'll say again. So this uh, flavor conservation is an, an assumption that uh, uh, should take place when you are converting a hadronic star into a quark star. Okay. So the transition should be so fast that although you have beta equilibrium forced during the hadronic phase. During the phase transition, there is no time for beta equilibrium to be enforced. Oh. So you have flavor conservation, but if you look at the equation of states, beta equilibrium is considered just for the hadronic part, not for the quark ah, part. Okay, I see. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a question from Rafael uh, reading the chat. Do, do you want to ask yourself, Rafael, or do you need to read it? I can read. Okay. Unless he wants to talk. Do you want to talk, Rafael? No, I he doesn't want to talk. You. Okay. That's right. I'll read it for uh, everybody. It's not. The increase and decrease of the crust length with magnetic field can be a microscopic manifestation of the magnetic catalysis and inverse magnetic catalysis. And then I didn't. I'll just answer the first part. No, I didn't. Call, I didn't uh, uh, look at both things at the same time. You see, so indeed, it's a manifestation of the feeling of the Landau levels. The magnetic catalysis is something that would have to be uh, looked at separately. So I didn't confront these densities or anything like that. So those are two separate studies. OK. And the chaotic magnetic the refers to a chaotic magnitude or orientation in space or both? Uh, no, the magnitude is not chaotic. It's fixed. And the orientation in space is such that the pressure um, is isotropic. Uh, it's, a, it's not a very intuitive uh, picture, um, but maybe if you look, look at Zeldovich's book, um, there is in the library at, at Ufski, then you can, see, you can understand a little bit better, but it's, uh, it has to do with uh, maybe what nicer um, looks when they have these hot spots, then there is uh, these chaotic fields. Well, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that it's how it is, but it's a, a way of making the calculation a little bit uh, more trustworthy than the ones is perpendicular and parallel pressure and just ignoring one. But this was something done in the past, maybe some years ago. Now is the Lorene code. I don't see any reason to, to use this chaotic magnetic field. I was just giving an overview. Not bad. Yeah, this uh, Lorentz code, what does it do exactly? I mean, which are the inputs and the outputs? And you enter have... with the magnetic chemical potential and infers the related magnetic field. And then it ca calculates poloidal fields. And mm -hmm. uh, you see, uh, I'm not an expert on the Lorene. The person who normally uses it is uh, the Barat, who worked with me. 
but it's a way uh, of taking into account all the equations that enter in the, into this uh, TOV equations, plus a magnetic field that can vary, and the variation is computed by the code itself. Mm -hmm. So Maxwell yeah, and Einstein equations are solved at the same time, as you say, which is the magnetic field, uh, the chemical potential. Uh, mag sorry, magnetic moment. Magnetic moment at the center of the star, and it computes the whole distribution. So does it allow for non-spherical configurations? Or? Yeah, it's not spherical. It's not, it's not cool. spherical. If you, if you look here, let's see. Mm -hmm. Here, you see that this radio is just, it's not a spherical radio, it's, it, it's defined which one it is. It's, can you see my hands? It's this radio and it's different from this one. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, the radio. It's e equatorial radius. Equatorial radius. Uh, it's equatorial radius. Okay, good. Yeah, it's different from this uh, distance. So, but it has uh, axial symmetry. Or not? No, not necessarily. No, no, no. Not, necessarily. not necessarily. Okay, good. Hmm? Okay, so I think we should finish because Deborah has to leave very soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very, 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 very busy person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank nice you to much. see you. Thank you. I will stop recording now. Okay. okay. Bye. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you very much. Good. Thank, Thank you. you.